Isabel for this nice introduction and uh, thanks also to the Global Plant Council for the invitation to present today and to you um, the International Plant Phenotyping Network. Today I will center my talk around how IPPN is fostering international collaborations in plant phenomics and plant phenotyping. I will uh, quickly introduce myself because uh, yeah, I don't know how many people uh, already know me outside of IPPN. I have uh, yeah, I have uh, lived my at least uh, professional life almost exclusively in the area of plant phenotyping in the last 10 years. I started in uh, academia uh, in uh, 2009. Uh, doing my diploma thesis here at the research center in Jülich, Germany, and then later on did my um, PhD also here um, at the IBG2 Institute of uh, Plant Sciences in Jülich on um, how to combine ecological studies and phenotyping. After that, I did my postdoc in the beautiful German city of Bayreuth, um, on the event experiments and uh, later on joined the phenotyping industry um, since I was hired by um, a technology provider in that area. Since 2019, I'm responsible for the operations inside the IPPN <clears throat> and I've been living my professional life in very various areas around the world. So the international part of uh, IPPN comes naturally to me. What am I doing in uh, IPPN? Uh, you don't have to read everything written on that slide. I will reiterate it throughout my talk. But if you look to the right side, you can see that the IPPN office, which is run by me here, um, overlaps within the organization and um, communicates between members here and the IPPN board on a variety of different tasks. And in the rest of the presentation, I will showcase you some, if um, not any, every of these tasks um, in more or less detail. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about why plant phenotyping is relevant, especially currently um, in our situation that we have all here, facing a global problem of uh, increasing uh, food demand, increasing crop demand uh, in function of an ever increasing world population that is um, projected to reach around 10 billion by uh, 2100. So with this development, it, although <clears throat> we, are, we are currently feeding uh, the world population quite well, there is still a number of above 800 million people that are uh, facing hunger in 2020, so right now. Um, so that means more than 100 million people more compared to last year. And with the projected development course, we are tackling a global problem here. Additionally, to this demographic need for uh, more crops and more feed, um, we are facing global change uh, currently, which is making the situation worse as um, projected or as announced by the um, by the FIO and the IPCC the food security will be increasingly affected by projected future climate change scenarios with a high confidence so in order to tackle these problems yeah which of which has a much higher complexity than I just uh, showcased here, um, taking into account uh, resource depletion, uh, reduction of arable land, yeah, 
any adaption to these developments involves the use of genetic resources as well as breeding programs uh, for crops as said by the FIO. So in consequence, we need to increase research activities and investment in crop, crop science in order to secure um, that our children and we have something in the fridge by tomorrow. And this requires us to disrupt our current methods of crop, crop production with new technologies and concepts. In order to do this, we need, of course, vast amounts of research and precise information about crops and their performance in different environments and especially under different stresses. So how can plant phenotyping alleviate this need? First of all, we should recap on what plant phenotyping is. Also, to all of you that are unfamiliar with the, with the term, a plant phenotype is formed as a result of the dynamic interaction of the plant genetic background with its environment. So you can say that the template is set by the genetic information in, in, in terms of the plant genotype. Uh, and this genotype is then interacting with the environment to form a certain appearance, a certain phenotype. With phenotyping or within plant phenotyping, we aim to quantitatively investigate these phenotypes as their function um, of a genetic code on the environment in order to better understand plants, to increase efficiency in our production, to on the same hand or on a different hand, sometimes to lower their environmental footprint of our agricultural systems and products, to increase on the same hand the yield, especially on particularly in stressful environments, because that's um, where the hotspots of current food insecurity lie globally, and to retain that yield in a higher quality and quantity production wise. And of course, plant phenotyping can also assist in finding novel traits, novel characteristic of agricultural products. So in that sense, IPPC flags the phenomics assisted breeding as a promising tool in deciphering the stress responsiveness of crop species, as stated by many researchers and many papers. So plant phenotyping can be considered as a tool, yeah, a tool using technology to assess crops. And this tool or this toolbox um, can support many different plant sciences, not only uh, crop breeding, but um, it can be a well for data for computational biologists or quant quantitative geneticists that want to uh, find particular uh, alleles for, for traits, plant physiologists, as they have uh, a higher resolution and a more detailed view on physiological plant processes within plants, horticultural scientists optimizing uh, or monitoring their production lines, certainly agronomists, but it also has implications for re remote sensing and ecologists. On the industry side, then, <clears throat> we have breeders, uh, companies working in, in biotechnology, in the agrochemical industry, fertilizer industry, such as growers and farmers, up to contract research organizations that can make use of this vast amount of data. So, closing that bracket and opening another one. What is IPPN? IPPN has the goal to integrate, collaborate, communicate, and facilitate the exchange within 
plant phenotyping as a young academic discipline. So in principle, it is a global network of institutions and companies which share the common goal to use synergies in the field to identify and research bottlenecks and uh, initiate joint projects to foster the communication, streamline the communication that leads ultimately to cooperation between the different stakeholders in the different areas, academia, industry, and the general public, to increase the visibility and impact of plant phenotyping and making people aware of the power of this tool and to facilitate training um, for the next generation of plant phenotyping researchers and practitioners. IPPN on a global scale and on a, on a scale of time here is the only true network within the many initiatives on a regional and national level um, in plant phenotyping. So we have a lot of PPNs roaming around uh, uh, on the globe. So we, on the bottom here, we have uh, the national initiatives that um, govern more or less plant phenotyping activities on their respective national ter territory, such as the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility doing it for Australia, Phenome, for uh, France, the DPPN, for Germany, and, and so on and so on. So many um, national or regionally fragmented communities, as you can say. And we have the, the regional ones inheriting a larger geographical footprint, like the North American plant phenotyping network, uh, or um, the pan-European research infrastructure emphasis, for example, that has a, a clear phenotyping focus up to cost actions, also working on regional level. And then we have the international level. And as you can see, IPPM is, was one of the first um, time-wise to be established and also has the the biggest geographical sphere of influence in there up to today so now i want to take you on a little history tour um, of how ippn came to be and uh, that leads us down to the year 2009 in 2009 Plant phenomics and plant phenotyping was in the beginning, so in the cradle. And uh, with, with um, Europe and Australia being among the first to um, investigate and um, practice plant phenotyping um, on, a, on a larger scale. Yeah, so the first International Plant Phenotyping Symposium was held in, in that year in Australia as um, the result of a European and Australian collaboration agreement and the start of uh, the High Resolution Plant Phenomics Center in Canberra. Yeah, um, so basically kicking off the APPF, the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility, which is a conglomerate of the CSIRO, the um, Australian National University, and the University of Adelaide. So, as I said uh, back then, um, our our principal chair, um, IPPN's chair, Uli Schur, and uh, Robert Furbank from CSIRO met on that occasion and came to the idea, hey, why not uh, launch a global initiative on plant phenotyping as a whole to integrate all these um, yeah more or less local um, plant phenotyping centers and uh, national plant phenotyping networks into one so uh, rob thought uh, well it's a great idea that uh, let's promote this emerging field 
and uh, soon others followed and uh, just as crops in a in a field yeah there were other people joining uh, their thoughts and said hey why don't we form a loose loose conglomerate of of uh, of uh, institutions in order to organize symposia on that topic of plant phenotype and then also many other ideas came like um, why not providing an open space to actively advance the field through working groups and the idea was born and a few i think seven around seven institutions already backed this idea back in uh, 2009 in the years, in the following years, this idea um, did grow and others were, were following um, the call of the initial seven, seven institutions. And one day during an EPPN uh, meeting, <clears throat> so a meeting of the European Plant Phenotyping Network, all these people came together on a bus ride through Barcelona. And Francois, uh, Francois Tardieu and, uh, from INRA and uh, Uli Schur were, were having the idea of why not creating an independent organization that is free from any national constraints and uh, identities and um, to have this as a true independent network where people can meet, exchange and collaborate so uh, in 2020, uh, 2015, the IPPN was uh, founded as a um, international nonprofit organization, um, according to German law, but that's just on the side. In the following years, um, the number of members gained. Yeah, in 2016, we had around 27 members. 2018, 39 members, 2019, the year I joined IPPN, 43 members, and 2021, current um, number of members is 53. So all that said, yeah, that is just a um, small recap, a small a summary of what I just said. Um, leaving us uh, here at the year 2021 uh, with uh, IPPN having around 1000 people that are actively contributing, participating to uh, the services and the program of IPPN with more than 40 academia institutions and 11 industry members. So that's just a small show of slide um, marking the uh, areas on the map where members are present and also here with this little leafy uh, icon marking the locations of past ipps international plant phenotyping symposia of which we've had so far six with the sevens that will come in 2022 but more on that a little bit later so you can see there are already a large group of members, although this map is not um, um, not not uh, representing all members, but uh, just the selection. We have a very strong uh, participation, very strong membership here in the European region, as this was once uh, considered the cradle of plant phenotyping. But we also have a, a very strong membership base in um, in in Asia yeah in Japan with the National Agricultural Research Organization NARO being one of our members with uh, the company Biopute uh, um, a, a um, Chinese distributor of phenotyping um, uh, equipment and phenotrade also a, a distributor and integrator of uh, plant phenotyping equipment here on the map, but also other uh, academic institutions like uh, INRA, CIMIT, or even Syngenta are among our members. But as you can see, 
there's always space for more. So uh, if you're interested, maybe even after this presentation, uh, feel free to uh, send me an email to, uh, to that uh, email here below. So IPPN was, uh, was growing in the past years. And of course, international collaborations are fostered. Yeah, and they need to be fostered. And why? Why they need to be fostered is in order to be able to better coordinate across the entire plant phenotyping community, especially taking up the initial thought of integrating across the whole world. Then to, uh, to exchange information, needs and requirements in each single geographic location because well the community and the field um, has different different faces and different shapes all around the globe to coordinate of course also joint symposia workshops and very practically speaking an alignment of calendars and um, to reduce uh, redundancy to address concepts for access of phenotyping um, technology and to uh, promote public private partnerships. Since uh, IPPN is open to academia and since 2018 also to industry, this has gained in importance in the recent years. And ultimately, uh, ultimately uh, we are enabling, enabling transnational research and development. So, the international and international plant phenotyping is um, first reflected by its international board. Yeah, that you can uh, see here among the um, organizational structure on the right. We have our primary chair and founding father Uli Schur from IBG2 in Germany. We have our academia section chair, uh, Jennifer Clark from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in the in USA. Our industry section chair, Vincent Jarling uh, from the company Phenovation. Our co-academia chair, Rick van der Zedde, that is currently heavily in duty um, finalizing uh, the NPEC uh, facilities in the, in Wageningen. More on that a little bit later. David Hahn uh, as our industry section co-chair and right at the bottom of everything there is me as the keeper of the IPPN office and operations. So you can see here on the top right the, the organizational structure and you can see right on the top is the General Assembly as the assembly representing our members. And these members are yeah, sorted into either academia or industry section, but uh, considered as a whole and also considered as the top gremium, also the, the, the top decision um, entity within IPPN. So IPPN, you can say IPPN is driven by its members and the exec, uh, executive board that you can see here is um, only in place to, to um, convert any, any demand of community into actions, of course, um, by help of myself. Yes, as you have heard in the history of IPPN, the International Plant Phenotyping Symposia reserve a special place inside uh, IPPN's uh, portfolio of different services for the, uh, for the plant phenotyping community. The IPPS uh, is a biannual meeting uh, of our community, of the International Plant Phenotyping Community, uh, which provides an, uh, a conference and a venue in which uh, there are sessions, as in every regular um, scientific uh, conference, yeah, on um, the state-of-the-art research and developments in the field. 
We provide uh, an exhibitor's um, space with the world's top technology providers uh, from that space. And uh, we, on the side, we um, try to complete the program with a suit of uh, different industry and academia events, workshops, and possibi possibilities for networking. By the way, the next IPPS will be in 2022, so next year. Originally, we planned to have it this year, uh, actually more or less now, but due to uh, Corona, we decided to postpone it in order to allow for international attendances. Um, it will be um, hosted by Wageningen University and Research in the Netherlands, and it will be um, during uh, September 27th until September 30th next year. Yes, that is just a snapshot of uh, some of the, the major uh, facilities on the campus, which are currently being extended um, by the aforementioned NPEC, the Netherlands Plant Eco Phenotyping Center, uh, which uh, is a large campus of different facilities and different technological tools that um, display the current state of the art of plant phenotyping equipment. And together with uh, the University of Wageningen, which has an exceptional expertise in crop science, they will uh, certainly provide a new era in um, plant phenotyping. And of course, the official um, opening of these facilities will coincide with the IPPS in 2022. So if you plan to pay Wageningen and the NPAC facilities a visit, the IPPS is the ideal um, occasion for that. Yes, but going back to the initial essence of IPPN and what uh, it does and should do to service the community, um, we have the IPPN working groups as one of the core um, yeah, institutions within the association. These working groups, um, currently of which there are seven in different fields, um, represent a group of experts which are always open and approachable even to non-members who want to participate. These working groups focus on specific topics um, in um, connection to plant phenotyping. They uh, disseminate information in these topics. They meet regularly, internally, but also publicly, and are supposed, uh, supported by the IPPN office and assisted uh, by a yearly uh, budget. So each of these working groups has um, certain funds at their, at their hands in order to um, promote the, uh, the goals of each individual working group, um, to um, organize workshops or satellite meetings, so little sub-meetings inside other conferences, to also expand uh, our outreach into other plant science disciplines. So I'm giving you um, a, a quick glimpse of a few of working groups uh, where I want to highlight um, the, the, the internationality of, um, of uh, these working groups. For example, our root phenotyping working groups, uh, which is currently chaired by uh, Michelle Watt from the University of Melbourne. Um, with um, renowned researchers um, in the field, in their um, executive uh, board, like uh, Malcolm Bennett from the University of Not Nottingham, UK, like Larry York from Oak Ridge uh, National Laboratory, Sorsha Tracy um, from uh, UC Dublin, or uh, Christophe Salon from uh, INRAE. <clears throat> And these working groups 
have certain aims as I just uh, as I just proclaimed, uh, such as written in here to be a forum to identify the scientific and technical boundaries of uh, root phenotyping or to advance the field in itself. And with their annual budget, they realize uh, different activities throughout the year. Um, like, um, for example, for the root phenotyping, they have provided certain travel grants in 2019. Wanted to do this uh, in 2020, but um, due to Corona, there was unfortunately no travel there. Um, so they converted their budget to, um, to sponsor uh, a suit of, of uh, videos made for the online conference. Um, regularly, you can find uh, members of our working groups in our phenomics webinars, our IPPN um, webinar series, where they keep you up to date on any current developments within their respective fields. Or they provide workshops, like in the uh, example of the advanced sensor applications working groups that is um, led by um, Stefan Gerd from uh, Fraunhofer and Robert Koller from a Research Center in Jülich, assisted uh, by Jennifer Clark, um, who did uh, in the past uh, three years uh, a regular workshop series on mini computers um, and, and um, programming languages, which are of course needed uh, as, a, as a technology background. Um, for plant phenotyping applications. Yeah. With all this technology being quite cost uh, intensive, um, we account also for, for researchers and countries that uh, don't have tremendous funds um, to be allocated into these technologies by our uh, affordable plant phenotyping working groups that seek out easy to build, easy to create um, self-built solutions for plant phenotyping with uh, low-cost sensors um, and installations and thereby, of course, also broadening the field of, of uh, applications and, and uh, possibilities also in face of, for example, um, developing countries where, where this approach and this technologies often can yield highest or best results and most importantly. So um, I'm looking at the time, I have to speed up a little bit, but I don't want you to miss um, on a few vital and key um, services that uh, IPPN provides, yeah. Um, our services include, uh, or, or let's say it like this, the best resemblance uh, and the most comprehensive set of, of resources IPPN provides through their website, uh, www.plant-phenotyping.org. You can read it right there, um, where we try to, to really display uh, most of, of the results and, and uh, information that, um, that you can provide in plant phenotyping. Uh, apart from this, um, so just an example, we uh, provide um, curated uh, news and, and important conferences yeah, on a daily basis. So uh, information um, about relevant conferences, relevant new findings, um, new publications, um, and of course also news from, from our organization uh, itself. Yeah? We provide um, um, yeah, contacts uh, for getting in contact with our working groups. We provide a, a um, updated list of, of vacancies and uh, job um, opportunities in that field and also provide some resources on uh, training and education, of course, while keeping you up to date on the latest news. We also have an IPPN uh, YouTube channel 
in which you can uh, see any video material that is uh, has been ever created by IPPN members or IPPN itself. Currently, we host more than 100 videos on the different topics and various aspects of uh, plant phenotyping, including workshop recordings, but also our regular uh, phenomics webinars series. We uh, provide newsletters four times a year yeah, that are summarizing highlights uh, of the past three months or the next three months. Um, on a, on a quarterly basis. And of course, we have YouTube, uh, we have uh, social media channels uh, with Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook, um, which provide you on a daily basis very, very recent uh, and actual information about plant phenotyping. Of course, feel free to like and subscribe or to reshare any content uh, there. So, of course, IPPN reaches out and collaborates beyond its own network. <clears throat> First of all, um, by connecting and communicating with other uh, plant science networks um, virtually, sharing or resharing um, information among each other, so relative, relevant information. But we are also present physically while we organize and um, um, represent IPPN in various conferences which uh, have either a distinct focus on plant phenotyping like uh, the phenome conference our own conference ipps or um, that have a connection with plant phenotyping in in some parts of the conference like with the SEB, the Society of Experimental Botany's annual meeting, the Rooting, the Eucarpia uh, conference, but also trade shows like Seed Meets Technology. Yeah, and there we always aim to disseminate the knowledge um, about plant phenotyping. So uh, we provide um, IPV and services by um, keeping uh, an, a global database on plant, re, um, plant uh, infrastructures. So either large or small installations which can be accessed also by international researchers and collaborators who um, maybe want to use the technology in order to answer their research question or um, corporate research question. Um, and of course, before you can do that, you first have to know <clears throat> what kind of facilities are out there, which, uh, what, what kind of traits do they monitor or um, phenotype, where are they located, yeah, often also very um, important for international co collaborations. And um, yeah, all this information is provided uh, in this infrastructure database, which you can access um, through our website. And this database is community fed. That means um, feel free to upload your installation if it is not already there. Um, that can highly increase the visibility of your phenotyping infrastructure and the possibility for collaborations, either national or international. Yeah, apart from this, uh, I want to close uh, my talk um, just quickly stating that there is a lot of more things like uh, the IPPN provides to increase the visibility, uh, the now knowledge base and also funding um, in, in our field, which is um, we, pro we, we um, write letter of support for research projects. We organize uh, special issues, um, for example, this in uh, JXBOT, which is closing, by the way, um, end of this month. So um, we uh, organize um, international surveys, uh, like the IPPN survey 2021. We do photo competitions, and of course, also do our own webinar series with uh, yeah, really recent and actual um, 
stories of uh, how plant phenotyping can be used in research or academia um, in different areas and uh, for different uh, for different plant sciences. So in summary, you could say IPPN represents and brings together international key players in academia and industry. We promote plant phenotyping to a global audience across all career stages. We facilitate joint activities and collaboration across borders, expand and advance the field and promote technological development. And uh, yeah, we try to provide this information comprehensively. Um, and also with this, we try to train our next generation of uh, plant phenotyping enthusiasts because we believe that they uh, that this is a powerful tool in order to feed the world of tomorrow so if you got interested through this presentation or through any of the uh, other ippn activities working group activities uh, also, feel free to join us. We are taking memberships on institutional basis. That means uh, you're, as long as your institution is a member, each employee of that institution or company is automatically a member. And with more members, that means more opportunities, more exchange, more services, a bigger audience, and thus more impact and more diversity, which is also very important to us. Feel free to contact me on uh, via, via one of the stated channels here and um, save the date for IPPS in 2022 in Wageningen. Thank you very much. And I'm 